Welcome back to the fourth installment in our series on LED luminaires, specifically on light planes. This is the continuation of part two, so this is the fourth video clip. Our goal in this series, if you have not realized it by now, is to guide you to the point where you can design and build your own LED illuminated light planes. So far we've covered properties and some behavior. We're going to continue with behavior in this video. We have yet to touch on LEDs, much less the fixtures themselves. At the end of the last video, we were discussing light source behavior, so we will pick it up there. In our last recording session, our last lecture, we stopped at a point where we were in a completely dark room, totally void of any reflected light. That doesn't mean there's not light in the room. That just means that you you don't see any light. No light is actually reflecting off any objects and through the lens of your eye onto your retina. This room that we were in, the walls, the ceiling, the floor, is coated with a flat black coating that absorbs all light. However, there is light in the room. In the ceiling were a couple apertures, openings, positioned to allow direct sunlight to enter the room, but not any scattered or diffuse light from the clouds or from the blue sky. So if you were to walk over directly underneath the aperture and look out, as you move around, you would finally move into a position where if you looked up, you would see the sunlight. And of course, the minute that you, or the instant that you actually walked over there and stood in that spot, now you are illuminated by the sunlight. Now, I don't know if you can imagine that or not. The reason we go through these uh, visualization exercises is to put you in the frame of mind where you are conscious of the behavior of light. And that's what we are discussing, the behavior of light. Up till now, we've had a source of light that was sunlight. From now on, we won't call it sunlight. We'll just, it'll be the light source. And after all, we're going to use light emitting diodes exclusively for our light sources. Since the light from the source is striking the surface and diffused as it is reflected, we will refer to this process on the screen as reflected diffuse light or diffuse reflected light or we call that a surface diffuser. So when the light source strikes that surface, remember that's the only thing in the room that's not totally flat black and the rest of the resume, the room, the rest of the room absorbs all light. This object though is a flat white coating on a rectangle. Now that rectangle may be part of another structure or a larger structure, but you can't see it because it's flat black. Our goal here is to be able to put light where we want it and avoid light going any place we don't want it. And if light goes someplace we don't want, it's going to have to be flat black. Otherwise you're going to see other objects and it's going to distort your image. So if that rectangle that you're looking at right now was part of a big square box and the box itself was not black, flat black, then you would see the box as well. And this is a surface diffuser. However, this is not the most popular result. It's the most common result because using spotlights and then directing the spotlight on the object that you want to illuminate, that's, that's pretty common practice. However, if you've worked with spotlights, you know spotlights aren't perfectly focused and aimed just on the object that you want to illuminate. It's going to illuminate everything else around it. It's going to create shadows and you would have to make everything around it flat black to absorb like a black curtain made out of a, a coarse fabric that would absorb the light very well. Uh, that's extremely difficult just to get a rectangle that's illuminated and nothing else around it. So a more popular method 
of diffusing light is an aperture diffuser. The diffuser is a membrane. In our case, we're going to use uh, a vinyl drop cloth, literally, an El Cheapo piece of drop cloth that you lay on the floor to keep paint from getting on your carpet or floor. And you can buy this at any of the popular large home improvement vendors. This light is referred to as transmitted diffuse light because as the light passes through the membrane, the film passes through the sheet, it is diffused, it's scattered. So if you held a piece of this material, and this could be, by the way, a translucent white plastic sheet. However, that product's much more expensive than the film. And then later on, we show you how to put another secondary diffuser on top of that that's more durable than that vinyl film. But anyway, this is transmitted diffuse light. But in general, we call this opening, which is now the light plane, because it scatters the light from the light source coming from the back, and it scatters it in all directions, including towards your eye. So you see the whole opening as a surface of light, a light plane. Now, if you cannot see this, the light source, in other words, if I remove that arrow in the text light source, and we were just looking at that rectangle, you would not know whether it was a surface diffuser or an aperture diffuser. The light plane is the light plane. The perception is a flat surface with light coming from it. Whether it originated from in front of the light plane or from behind is a matter of convenience of design, although the aperture diffuser usually provides the best result. Let's pick a round area on either the surface diffuser or the aperture diffuser and shine some light on it, starting with a red LED. So here's our red LED, and this is a slide that you've looked at before. Remember, whether we are illuminating a matte white surface from the front or a translucent sheet from the back, a red spot is a red spot to the viewer. It is a round red light plane. Now let's extinguish the red LED and turn on the green LED. Remember, whether we are illuminating a matte white surface from the front or a translucent sheet from the back, a green spot is a green spot to the viewer. It is a round green light plane. Now I'm going to repeat certain things many times because I'm trying to pound home a point. So don't get annoyed with the repetition. I, I want you to hear it as often as possible. And when I'm doing most of my lectures, I have a particular experience level in mind that I'm addressing. I am after the person who probably is starting with the least amount of knowledge about any subject. I try to make it interesting for the ones that already have quite a bit of knowledge. But if the ones that already have quite a bit of knowledge are, are unhappy with this presentation, uh, they should just fast forward and not worry about the amount of repetition or the detail or me explaining it in many, many different ways and different angles. Now, if you know anything about artificial intelligence or neural nets, and neural nets is a synthetic or artificial duplication of how the brain functions. When a, a child is born, they spend most of their life in two or three rooms of the house. And as they start to understand language and they hear the term house, what comes to mind is the internal views of the rooms that they've spent time in. And even when they leave the house, being carried in a car seat or one of those little child carriers, they may or may not even see the house from the outside. If you really try to visualize what a child sees when they, in their mind when they hear the word house, it's not very much. Most of it is the internal views of the rooms that they spend time in. However, as they continue to grow and have more experience, they come to recognize the view from the sidewalk or from the driveway as the house. And that's the outside of the house. 
that was added to what they previously thought was the house, and that was just the inside. When they get a little bit older and they can run around outside, now they see the other three sides of the house. If they get really frisky, they might climb up on the roof and see the roof. They might go down the basement and see the basement. The more views you have of an object, the more you know about it. So I try to hit things from more than one angle. Okay, so green spot. We're looking at a green spot on the screen right now. That's a round green light plane. It's produced by LEDs in the background, but the light is emanating from that round green light plane. Now let's go to blue. Remember, whether you're illuminating a matte white surface from the front or a translucent sheet from the back, a blue spot is a blue spot to the viewer. It is a round blue light plane. Now let's add, uh, let's turn the red and the green back on. We had, we had just the red on a minute ago and you had a round red light plane. You add the green and you've got a yellow round light plane. Now let, let me explain something. Right now, your eye, because remember, this is an LED flat screen that I'm looking at. Now, I doubt you're looking at this video right now on a cathode ray tube. But even if you were, all of the yellow, the, the entire yellow area, if you're looking at a cath cathode ray tube, the yellow is made up of red and green dots. Your eye, your retina, it sees the red photons and the green photons. So when we had just red, I had a certain number of red photons passing through my iris, through the lens, the iris in, into the eyeball, onto the retina in the back. And on the back of my retina was a round red circle. When I add the green, I didn't eliminate the red. I just added green wavelengths to the red. So on the back of your eye, the cones, they see the red and the green photons. That image of the red and the green photons and the area that they cover on the retina goes through the optic nerve to the brain, and the brain perceives yellow. It's amazing, really. When you study the eye and how the brain processes it, it's just absolutely amazing. So anyway, enough of that nonsense. Let's extinguish the red and turn on the blue. Now we have a, a cyan spot. A cyan spot is a cyan spot to the viewer. It is a round cyan light plane. We still have the same quantity of green photons reflecting into your eye, and to that we have added an equal number of blue photons. Whenever we add a second color, like added the green to the red, we'll back up to that, when we added the green to the red, we doubled the number of photons. Green with red is twice the light that red or green by itself. That's why when you add colors, the result is a brighter result. In this case, yellow. So yellow is twice the light energy of red or just the green, either one by itself. Yellow is twice that. And you can see just by looking at this, yellow is much brighter than the red, much brighter than the green. There's our cyan round light plane. And here we have a magenta round light plane. And again, on the back of your retina, the cones, the sensors back there see red and it sees blue, but your brain perceives it as magenta. Now, we throw all three LEDs on together. Now remember, this white spot, this white round light plane, is a surface and light is coming from it. Whether there are three LEDs that are spots, simultaneously spots coming from the front to create that white disc, or coming from the back, it really doesn't matter. We just want to create the perception of a round white light plane. Now, we, we did the primary colors, Let, and we did some secondary colors. We did the three primary, red, green, and blue. We did the three secondary, which were yellow, cyan, and magenta. Oh, and, then, and here we did white. Now, obviously, if we just turned all three off, we'd have black. <laughs> we'd just see nothing. We'd be back in the dark room all by ourselves. 
So we'll do one more that is not a secondary color, and that's we're going to take red. we got a red round light plane, and we're going to throw a little green in there. Now, I don't know if you saw it really go from red to orange or not, so let me go back. Red, orange, very, very slight difference. And you're going to find when you create your uh, fixture and you're adjusting the level on the different colors of LEDs, if you want orange, you're going to turn the red all the way up to maximum. And remember that each of these three LEDs in your light plane, the light source for your light plane, is going to be driven by an 8-bit driver. And 8 bits, uh, and it doesn't really matter what a bit is, but a pattern of 8 bits, zeros and ones, gives you 256 combinations of ones and zeros. It's a binary function. Each of these colors, red, green, and blue, you can adjust from 0 to 255 in increments. So 0, is, it's off. 1 is just barely on. 2, it's on a little bit more. 3, a little bit more. And you can keep increasing. So you have 0 through 255 steps for each color. Now, when you create orange, you turn on the red full power because, remember, you want the brightest possible. Now, if you don't want a bright light plane, then don't turn the red all the way up. But the point is, you need red to get orange. And to red, you add a tiny bit of green. If you keep increasing the green, it's going to go to yellow. And if your LEDs aren't equalized, meaning that red, green, and blue full tilt should give you white, but you're going to find it doesn't. Because the not all LEDs are equal in luminosity. With most RGB LED strips, if you turn the red all the way up, as you start turning the green up, it goes orange, it goes yellow, but it's not going to stop at yellow if you keep going with the green. It's liable to end up kind of greenish yellow because the green is a little bit stronger than the red. Not to worry though. Let's move on. Once again, we start with red. We add a little green and we get orange. If we add more green, we get yellow. Less green, orange. More green, yellow. Now let's discuss real LEDs, light emitting diodes. If you do not know what a diode is, you do not need to know what a diode is to design and build LED luminaires. You need to understand light behavior and you need to work with LEDs, and we will go over the details of the electrical things that you have to deal with, and it's really, it's really pretty simple. There's only a few things that you really have to know, but we're going to throw out much more information than you need. That way you can pick and choose what you want. You just need to know how they behave in order to specify which LEDs that you need to accomplish your light plane to create your desired perception in the space of illumination. Here are three LEDs, a red, a green, and a blue LED. We are going to hit a few technical details that you do not need to know. However, there will be those watching this video who will see some of this information and have their interest piqued and go on to find more information about LEDs and electronics in general on their own and will have gained a whole new direction in their lives. I'm, I'm speaking specifically about people who are looking for something of interest. What do one of these puppies here look like inside? Now, if your eyes are glazing over at the sight of this, please put your hands over your ears and hold them there until the graphics change to the next slide or two. And when you stop seeing things you don't want to hear about, then you can take your hands away. Or you can fast forward a little bit. Or you can just take a chance that you will understand some or all of this. Or if you are bored to tears, then just fast forward through the next few slides. Diodes, all diodes, they're called rectifiers as well. 
Alternating current is what comes into your house from the power poles. That's alternating current. The electricity actually flows in two directions through the wire. In other words, it oscillates or alternates direction. And it goes one direction and then the other direction 60 times a second. So 120 times a second, it is going in a direction, but half of them are in one direction, the other half in the other direction. Diodes are used to rectify, in other words, to cut out one half and only provide, allow current to flow in one direction. So you see here, looking at this, that you have a negative voltage applied to the cathode. See, it says cathode minus negative, and a positive voltage applied to the anode plus. If you look real close between those two arrows, you will see an insulated gap or electrical isolation between the two metal pins that we're pointing to. The anode and the cathode pins, by the way, notice the flat spot on the base of the LED. That's to designate which end is the cathode or which pin is the cathode. Anyway, so if you look close between those two metal pins, you will see a space, and that is to electrically isolate those two pins. That means that all of the current flow must travel through whatever connects those two pins, whatever bridges the gap. Looking closely again at the center of this device, you will see a thin wire extending from the positive lead to the center of the reflective cavity. That reflective cavity is a yellow, looks like a disc with a hole in it. It's actually a concave surface, like a reflective lens on a flashlight. At the center of the reflective cavity is where the light is emitted from. That's where the semiconductor material and the current flowing through it is, we'll say, generating light energy. The reflector, the reflective cavity there, reflects the light up out of the cavity into and through the epoxy lens. The epoxy lens, through refraction, further configures those light photons into the desired pattern, typically 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 degrees. Now, there's a lot of scattered light that comes off of these two because an epoxy lens is far from perfect, and the impurities in it, the imperfection, cause some light to be scattered and not all focused in a perfect beam. Anybody that's played with the really nice flashlights that allow you to adjust the lens, or I should say adjust the reflective lens, the reflector, and the position of the light source within that, know that it's difficult to get an absolute perfect focus out of anything. Now let's go total geek and look closer at the cones of emission from the tiny point from which all of that light is emitted. And some of these LEDs are going to, they're just absolutely amazing how much light comes out of a little tiny device like an LED. Now don't let these images freak you out here. I know, I know they look technical, but let's do this anyway. So don't strain your brain. To absorb all this. The semiconductor material that generates the light is made up of billions of atoms. Not millions, but billions. Atoms of which no human has ever seen with their eyes. Please don't send emails and comments that they have seen atoms. You could use an electron microscope and basically it's Electron microscope would be like you sticking your hole through a wall into a room and you can't see it with your eyes. But you stick your hand in there, you find something, and you kind of squeeze it, feel it, slap it, and then eventually you build an image in your mind of what you felt with your fingers. That's a pretty crude way to describe electron microscope. No one's seen an atom with their eye. No one has ever seen light reflected off of an atom the lens, through the lens in their eye, through the iris, and created an image on the back of their retina. That would be pretty amazing if they could do that. Anyway, so no one's ever seen an atom. 
but we know how atoms behave. So there's billion of atoms in one tiny little LED. Each one of these billions of atoms has light emission that comes out in a pattern of cones, as you see here. The one on the left is an atom that is allowed to emit its light in all directions. So it has six cones of emission, up, down, and to four sides. The one on the right, there is a white reflective substrate underneath of the semiconductor material, and that pushes most of the light up away from that white surface. So the light that would normally go down actually is reflected up to join the light that was going up anyway. So when we say cones of emission, I don't want you to picture these. I want you to picture the actual combined light that the cone of emission is actually shaped by the reflective cavity and by the epoxy lens. When I say cone of emission, that's the cone of emission I'm talking about, not this one. Now that might have been one too many geek slides for you, but the geek in me just can't pass it up. You know, I hope this piques somebody's interest to learn more about LEDs and electronics. This is an LED, and this is the original red, green, blue LED, one of the original ones. Notice it has four wires, four conductors, four pins, four leads, whatever you want to call them. The LED that we looked at before in a previous slide only had two leads, one negative, one positive. This one has one lead that is common to three LEDs mounted into one device. So this is an LED device, not just an LED. It has three LEDs inside of that little epoxy case. But since all of them have a negative lead and a positive lead, positively inside the case, we can hook if we want all the positive leads together and then put negative on whatever pin we want for whatever color we want. And of course, already you're probably thinking, well, if there's red, green, and blue in there, then we can control the amount of power or voltage or current through each of those individual pins and get all kinds of colors from that one LED. Well, that's correct. So this is the original red, green, blue LED. Now you don't really need to know this, but we're just kind of putting you ahead of the curve when we talk about RGB devices a little bit later. So four leads, conductors, or wires, one common to all three colors, and then one, one each for red, green, and blue. Now I always say RGB, red, green, blue, but when we start looking at LED strips, you're going to see that they don't put them in that exact same pattern. I think it's blue, red, green, something like that. But it really doesn't matter, as long as you keep track of who's on first and who's on second. Okay, here's a bunch of light-emitting diodes in all forms of packaging. And I'm not going to go through and explain what all these different packaging formats are. But there is one of interest there. And that is the third from the right. There's the yellow one and the little clear one. You can see the gap between the two pins. Then you see a white epoxy with three leads coming out of it. Now this is a tri-color. It's not a red, green, blue. It's a three-color. So you're thinking, well, wait a minute. If you have a common and then two LED leads, how are you going to get three colors? Well, it should be dawning on you already that if you had a red and a green LED inside of that, little epoxy case, you got a common, then you've got a red lead and a green lead. Didn't we just create other colors from red and green? That's right. The original use for this was you could have red, green, or turn them both on and have amber or yellow. These were very common. If you've been paying attention, then you probably donned on your yellow or amber as soon as I said that there was a red and a green. Now, where do you see LEDs in use every single day? I mean, even in your house, you've got electronics that have LEDs on them. I have two high-res monitors in front of me right now. And uh, down in the lower right corner is a real tiny red dot that shows me that the monitors are on. Those are LEDs. 
if I look around the room, I see my USB hub, and it's one of these uh, Space Cadet units that has blue LEDs in it, so it gives you kind of a spacey feel. I look over at the treadmill, uh, but that's an LCD monochrome display, but I see another 32-inch TV over there with a red LED. I see a computer tower sitting across the room on a shelf that's turned on. I use that to stream HD content into the TV or turn on the cable to the same TV. So I see LEDs all around me, but if I were to go out of the house, where do I see LEDs? Well, traffic lights. And you can see the individual red and green LEDs in those two images. I often wondered why they don't use tricolor LEDs. I, I guess I just answered my own question. They turn on the yellow light uh, before they turn off the green sometimes. In other words, sometimes you'll see two of these on at a time. You never see the red and the green on together, but you might see the amber on with the green. Now, most traffic lights, it's green, then it goes amber to warn you that it's going to go red. So I often wondered why they can't have a single array of tricolored LEDs, and it's either red, green, or yellow. But anyway, the big advantage of this application right here is longevity. They won't have to change any of these lights for many years to come. And there's an energy savings, energy conservation. And I think they're actually nicer to look at than the older style. Now, where else do you see LEDs in everyday life? Automobiles. Uh, taillights is where they showed up first in most automobiles. So you see two LED arrays, one in the taillight, then you see another up behind the rear window. That's also an LED array. Now, automobiles, uh, they have really come a long way. I think that this covers every single application for light in a car. Then there is the application that will be controversial to be sure. Probably the biggest, single biggest application for LEDs. That's going to be the domestic light bulb. It has been said that when a 100 watt replacement bulb, that means an LED bulb that puts out the same amount of light as a 100 watt incandescent bulb, when it becomes available with LEDs for $10, that will be the end, now, not only of incandescent light bulbs, but fluorescent fixture bulbs. Most people don't like fluorescent bulbs because they don't like the temperature of the light. Temperature meaning the actual spectrum. But believe me, you can buy fluorescent bulbs now in any, almost any spectrum that you desire. Currently, a 100 watt replacer in LEDs is still over $20, typically around 25 to 30. And most of them do not propagate light in the same pattern as an incandescent or fluorescent bulb. This example here is better than most because it radiates light towards the socket end of the bulb. Most lighting fixtures are designed for incandescent bulbs which cast a lot of light downwards from the bulb. One of our future projects will be uh, how to build a shade or an adapter that will focus or reflect some of the light down from an LED bulb to adapt it to a traditional shade because traditional light shades are designed for traditional incand incandescent bulbs. They're not even designed for fluorescent bulbs. And uh, if you are a green person, I'm a con I'm a uh, conservationist, but I'm not really a tree hugger, but I definitely believe in saving energy and being a good custodian of our environment. Fluorescent bulbs are actually quite poisonous to the environment when they break. A lot of nasty chemicals in them, so I don't know which is worse. But LEDs are a good thing. LEDs are a good way to produce light, and you're going to see more and more LED bulbs out there. However, we're going to use something different. For our fixtures. We're going to stop here. We've hit 40 minutes, a little bit longer than I like to go in one clip, just to give you a break and not make you try, I mean, you leave after 20 minutes, 
25 minutes, and then you got to try to find your way back to the spot where you're at. So we, we're, I'm trying to keep them below 30, and it just isn't working out because I lose track of time. So anyway, this is the end of what would be actually the fourth clip. And we kind of want a little past behavior of light energy. We got into LEDs. Cover the basic of basics of LEDs. In the next video, we'll probably start with LED strips. So we've already talked about LEDs, and we're going to start with LED strips. Thank you for watching.